Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are going to have this morning's committee work in two segments. Um, first, we're going to take a look at a, a governance change proposal that um, that John Gannon and I have been working on and that Chris Roop will present for us. Um, and so similar to uh, similar to when your committee chair puts a, a bill proposal on the table and you have questions about why um, why something appears the way it does, uh, you know, the why of it, that the how it works and how it fits together, Chris can uh, can very easily answer, but um, but I just wanna be real clear that this is a proposal that's coming from me, not from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, and so we'll go through this government's gov governance uh, change proposal and, uh, you know, take as many committee questions as we need to, to understand how it all fits together. Um, and then my hope is that <clears throat> that will that will leave us, you know, near our mid morning um, break from committee and we'll break for 20 minutes or a half an hour and then come back and and take a look at a plan design proposal um, as well this morning. So uh, is everyone able to get the document off the committee page um, under today's date? All right. Thank you, Chris, for being with us this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Roop, and I'm a fiscal analyst with the Joint Fiscal Office. Today, I'm going to step slightly out of my number crunching role to provide you with a high-level summary of the proposed changes to pension governance that uh, the chair has brought before this committee for consideration. So I'm moving on to slide two. Overall, the goals and objectives behind this proposal were to, to increase both the level of professional expertise and range of perspectives that are represented at the decision-making team, maintain the representation and participation from key employee and employer stakeholders in the governance of the pension system, streamline the decision-making process around changes to actuarial assumptions, and require more frequent experience studies and enhance transparency around investment fees. Moving on to slide three. Let's start off with a quick refresher on how things are structured now. Becky Wasserman from Legislative Council provided you with a more detailed presentation on these topics a few days ago. But just as a reminder, we've got a group called VPIC, the Vermont Pension Investment Committee, and three boards of trustees for each of the individual retirement systems. VPIC is the seven member committee that has responsibility for managing the investments for all three retirement systems. The three boards of trustees are responsible for the general administration and operation of the retirement systems, adopting mortality and service tables based on actuarial recommendations, record keeping, setting regular interest rates and designating the actuary. Each of the statutes setting up the trustee boards looks a little different, but these are the common themes throughout. And notably, all three boards plus VPIC right now need to agree to any changes in the assumed rate of return. And here's just some background on who sits on these trustee boards. The names of the trustees are posted on the treasurer's website. Moving on to slide four, let's pivot over to the real heart of the proposal. This proposal envisions creating a new board called the Vermont Retirement Commission to oversee the investments and management of all three systems. This model has some resemblance to the one used in New Hampshire. The VRC is envisioned to have 15 members on it. It would be chaired by the state treasurer who would vote to break ties. The VRC would also have the commissioner of finance and management on it because of that individual's responsibility for managing the state budget. The governor would appoint two commissioners that must have institutional investment, financial, or actuarial experience. The three trustee boards would also play a big role here in shaping the membership of the commission. There would be three members of the retirement systems, who, and they could be actives or retirees, who serve on the respective boards of trustees and are appointed by those boards. And these member representatives, uh, you know, ideally would be drawn from the ranks that, that, are currently, that are currently in the trustee boards and serve as a link between the trustee boards and the major and, and, the, and the Vermont Retirement Commission. Each trustee board would also nominate a slate of employer representatives to serve on the commission. So there'd be a member representing VSERS, the teachers, and VMERS employers. And the trustee boards would nominate at least three names per vacancy. And the treasurer would pick one from each of those slates. 
Similarly, each trustee board would nominate members of the public who have institutional investment, financial, or actuarial experience to serve on the commission. Each trustee would have one, uh, each trustee board would have one public seat and they'd nominate no fewer than three candidates per seat. But the governor would make these appointments, not the treasurer. And there would be two legislative appointees, one per body, who must have institutional investment, financial, or actuarial experience and may not be elected officials. These legislative appointees would not have a vote on the commission. The proposal also calls for staggered four-year terms and limits of three consecutive terms or 12 years, except for the treasurer and commissioner in finance and management who serve on the commission by virtue of the offices they hold. Aside from the state treasurer, uh, the proposal calls for no elected officials to serve on the commission. Moving on to slide five. So this new commission is proposed. What do they do? The proposal calls for this new commission to absorb all of the current powers and duties of VPIC. The commission would also appoint five of its members to sit on an investment committee. And three of those members would need to have institutional investment, financial, or actuarial experience. The role of the investment committee is to review the recommendations and selection of the investment consultant, review the recommendations around asset allocation and the hiring and termination of fund managers, and they would also provide recommendations to the full commission for final action. The proposal also calls for the investment committee members to serve for unlimited, staggered two-year terms. But it's important to note that since these folks are also members of the overall commission, they'd be subject to the overall commission term limits of 12 years or three uh, consecutive four-year terms. The proposal calls for the existing three trustee boards to stay in place, but with the additional power to nominate those members, nominate the employer reps, and nominate the public reps to sit on the commission. The trustee boards would also have a formal role with reviewing the actuarial recommendations that pertain to their memberships. They would have to make a recommendation to the commission on whether the commission should accept or reject any changes proposed by the actuaries or investment consultants but these recommendations would not be binding on the State uh, Vermont Retirement Commission. The commission would have final authority to adopt changes to the assumed rate of return and actuarial assumptions without requiring the concurrence of all three trustee boards, which is currently the practice. Slide six summarizes all of these changes in a side-by-side -side format. I won't spend a lot of time on this right now, but I wanted to make sure you had the summary because I often find formats like these are easier for comparing and contrasting different proposals. And on slide seven, this table focuses just on the proposed changes to powers and duties. You can see here that the proposal calls for the new retirement commission to absorb the duties of VPIC and form a five member investment committee. The proposal also calls for giving the commission the final authority over adopting changes to the assumed rate of return and actuarial assumptions, but requires the three trustee boards to review and make recommendations on those changes before doing so. So on slide eight, there's in addition to creating a new expanded retirement commission with more streamlined decision-making processes, the proposal also includes a few other governance changes that this committee has heard references to in the last few weeks. One recommendation is to statutorily require experience studies every three years instead of every five years, which is a recommendation the state treasurer has voiced support for. Another recommendation is to statutorily require more disclosure around the costs of running the pension systems with a specific focus on more disclosure around investment manager fees. And a third recommendation calls for streamlining and making the appointment process to all of these boards a little more consistent by designating the treasurer's office to oversee and administer the election process of the trustees to all three trustee boards plus the uh, commissioners to the new retirement commission. So that's the end of the overview and the outline of the proposal. And I'll turn it back over to the chair to entertain any questions or discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And um, committee, while you're while you're formulating questions and, and getting your hand button uh, ready. I just want to say that you know this is this is a proposal that um, <clears throat> you know that we're putting on the table that the decisions about how we move forward um, will be made here by the committee after we've had a chance to hear uh, reactions from uh, members of the public, from members of the employee groups, um, from the treasurer, et cetera. 
And uh, you know, if we can, if we can agree that the objectives that uh, Chris outlined for me at the beginning of his um, presentation are important, and we can find a different way to move forward to achieve those objectives, then uh, you know, that's what I expect we'll do here uh, as a group together over the over the coming uh, days and weeks. So, um, Bob Hooper has a question. A shocker, I bet. Um, uh, Chris, w what's the anticipated increase in cost that this proposal would bring forward? Uh, I that's a great question. I'm not sure um, we've we've done any sort of fiscal analysis on this. Um, I'm not sure there would be a lot of increased costs aside from more frequent experience studies. Um, you know, the 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 trustees I don't believe are envisioned to, of any of these boards are envisioned to serve with compensation. Um, uh, and, and that could be a topic of discussion that, that the committee may want to explore. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly what experience studies cost. I can tell you in the grand scheme of, uh, you know, uh, a pension system with $5 billion in assets across all three plans that, that the, the additional increase with doing them every three years instead of every five years is, is not going to significantly move the needle um, in the overall scope of the pension system. Um, it may be an additional expense of a few hundred thousand dollars, um, but that's a number that I think we could, we could ask the treasurer to drill down on. What, what does the experience study cost every year? And, you know, there are some interesting things in here, quite frankly, uh, but there are some things in here that evoke memories of VPIC number one, which was 17 people, which we found to be completely and totally unworkable. And that's why we moved after a long process of consultation with structure professionals to the six people that we have now. Uh, I'm somewhat troubled that we're patterning this after New Hampshire, which has worse returns than we do, a huge unfunded liability based on that. And uh, aren't a shining example on the Hill. Um, a couple of things that, I mean, I have no objection to the idea of bringing experience in. Uh, it's where it comes from. I have an initial reaction that I'm not entirely sure why the treasurer or any other circumstance should dictate who the employees send to this board. And that's my first three minutes of looking through the thing. Um, but it does have some some things that are, you know, have merit. Um, quite frankly, with regard to the VPIC passing a motion yesterday to say they would like to re-examine structure just to make sure they're still at best practice, uh, forcing something down the throat seems inappropriate. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have to say at first blush this, I find this very interesting. Um, obviously, for amount of time, effort and thought went into it. Um, just a couple initial observations, and this is probably where I'm going to be a little different from the member from Burlington in that um, not having the relationship like he's had. But I, I do find having this 15-member board um, rather intriguing and my question is, is why keep the other three sub boards for lack of a better way to phrase it? It does seem if we're looking to streamline this a bit and make it even more responsive, it seems that having an additional layer of board may make it a little more cumbersome. And the other question I have, and this is something that can probably come out in conversations is, one of my concerns has been that we have not always had the type of professionals on these boards that we should have. And I'm just, my question is, is there a precedence where a fund manager that is currently managing a fund that we have investments in can be a member of one of these boards, maybe a non-voting member, but to get the expertise and accountability that we would require to have this be successful. Um, but first glance, there's a lot of good stuff to talk about here. 
Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Rob. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, a lot of people have, have cited to um, a Center for Retirement Research at Boston College um, article, does public pension board composition, composition impact returns? And, and there's a couple of things that I think that this new structure um, is consistent with, with some of the recommendations um, that are contained in that report. For example, it says there's extensive research that has related to a higher proportion of board members with financial expertise to improve investment performance of investment funds. And that's something, unfortunately, that, that's missing from VPIC right now, or at least what's in statute, is the requirement that anybody have investment expertise. Well, the statute does call for people to get training. Um, I, I think it's very important that we do have investment expertise um, that are managing our investments, um, especially uh, institutional um, experience, because I mean, I, I think that's really important. I think this new structure also is consistent with that report because it adds stakeholders from all, all groups that are interested in how our pensions are performing. Um, government officials, the public, um, members of the various uh, unions. And so I think it, it provides a very good mix, which is something else that the Boston College Center for Retirement Research article um, it makes it important. And I think the size, you know, size is, is within, you know, distribution of public plan board members. So, I mean, I, I think that's important to remember too. I think um, those are, are things that are important to, to consider as we move forward. Thank you. So committee, any other uh, clarifying questions, first blush reactions? Um, we will certainly uh, be diving into this with all of the uh, members of the public and employee groups who might wanna come and talk about uh, this proposal as well. Uh, but I wanna make sure that <clears throat> the committee in this instance gets uh, you know, a full understanding of, of what uh, of what this proposal looks like so that we can <clears throat> plug in people's reactions. Um, Peter Anthony has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I'm trying to think of in the previous presentations, how many examples that we have assayed um, had uh, the uh, uh, top level, if I may use that term, um, of uh, essentially the expertise group, uh, essentially being able to make the actuarial and investment decisions uh, without necessarily the support of any of the underlying constituencies. Um, yes, the treasurer is there, uh, but I'm thinking of any of the uh, people with, pardon the phrase, the skin in the game. It's, it's. Uh, I can, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I can imagine a situation where the other constituent um, members of the pension community, however you define that, would say, gee, I, uh, we're really um, unhappy or displeased or nervous about the way the commission is going to go, um, and and well, I assume comedy and respect would would generate its own uh, dynamic. It seems to me there is nothing in the structure which uh, prevents uh, a sort of imposition, if you will, by the commission, uh, who may feel strongly about a particular direction or conclusion. Um, uh, not to be dis, uh, disturbed or need the necessary support of any of the other uh, constituent members of the, as I call it, pension community, however you wanted to find that. That's my, that's my uh, um, first uh, reaction to a, a, a very different change in uh, who gets to sort of um, set the various bars. Uh, and the uh, architecture of uh, investment strategy. But it's very interesting and there are lots of neat things about it. Uh, that's the only thing that popped out of me initially, thanks. 
Um, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Peter brings up interesting point. Uh, in VPIC currently, uh, we opted to elect the chair, um, noticing that the potential for the treasurer to be uh, the political aspect of things that we have supposedly tried to steer away from here, uh, that made that a higher possibility. Um, I, the question that I really wanna ask though, and I'll direct it to John, since this is one of the things that he has talked about a lot is, what constitutes the institutional investor experience that you're talking about? Aside from the fact that there are very few institutional investor sort of level uh, groups in Vermont, uh, we're expecting people to come and volunteer for a whole day once a month. Um, I think of somebody that sits on the board now that your proposal would exclude, uh, Joe Mackey, who has been on the board for 20 years doing investment at this level, would he be included or excluded? Uh, is there a definition someplace that we're using as a guideline? Um, I think this experience is gonna be hard to find to some degree. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, thanks. I, I mean, right now there's no definition for an institutional investor, but there's asset managers across the state of Vermont. Um, you know, we have a member of the house who, who does private equity. Um, so I don't think it, it's going to be that difficult to find people to serve in this role. Um, but I think based on the past investment experience of VPIC um, and based on, you know, research that's been done, uh, we need to find more people with investment experience and institutional investment experience to help guide the investment decisions that are made. Um, the, research, the research supports that, Bob. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, John. And I'm, I said there's some interesting things here, but it seems like we're leaning towards everybody almost having some kind of experience in that regard and excluding people who have been doing it for 20 years. And I know your position basically is that they've done a poor job, but uh, it is what it is. It needs to be defined. Yep. These are all conversations that we will have here in committee and that I'm sure many folks who are following this conversation um, will want to uh, enlighten us on. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, um, looking through this, the, uh, the Rorat Retirement Commission, it's pretty clear they're going to have a lot of oversight and input into the investment side of the equation. Um, but I don't see anything about the benefit side as to whether they would have any influence on that at all. Is there? So that, um, I think that that necessitates us understanding what the current VPIC and board of trustees, uh, structure, um, does in that realm and understanding how we, would mirror that or change that if we move to a different structure. Chris, do you have a do you have any thoughts on how to <clears throat> how to delineate that in current you know, in current structure? I, I think I think that's a really fair question. You know, I'm I'm not sure the extent to which the current boards of trustees exert influence over plan structure as much as whether those are hashed out at you know at the bargaining table or or through legislation. Um, so you know I think you know, I think ultimately, like the, the current VPIC right now and, and many retirement systems out there, you know, they, they have less to do with uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts of what the benefits look like and, and more about making sure that the system is administered and, and making sure that the funds are, are managed in a way to, to achieve all the objectives. So, you know, I think the, the fiduciary role would, would rest with this retirement commission, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the decisions about what the, what the appropriate benefit structure would look like would would likely reside uh, where they currently reside, which which is with you all and, and at the bargaining table. Sure. Um, I have to say for me going forward, I, I think that they need to have some input into that, what it would look like, I don't know, but it just feels like that we're, we're asking 
one hand that's writing the check and not talking to the other hand that's got to put the money in the bank. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you very much. Um, looking at this, it's nice. It's nice to put my eyes on something, and I have to sort of echo that my the place I really want to suss out more is finding that balance. That balance between the people who, yes, have I, I agree that we need people with that financial background, but we also need people who are going to be impacted, really weighing in on on those decisions. And for me, that balance isn't qu quite here. Um, and I'm obvious. I'm still trying to to wrap it all into my head as well, but I do think that we need to think about just what, what does that balance look like and who is who is at the table, making sure that as it's been said, the people with skin in the game that stand to really lose get, get a real voice in the process. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Hal Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I like how this governance proposal is, is really developing. And I guess what I'm curious to know is what other states have similar governance models that we might deem as best practices and you know how are they performing and and you know how do we learn from what maybe is already out there that's moving in this direction yep. thank you definitely a um, fair question uh, john gannon So uh, let me try to um, respond to Rob and Hal's comments. Um, with respect to, to Rob's comments about um, boards um, having input on the benefit structure, um, in looking at some research out there, there is at least one other state that has a board that if they fail to meet the assumed rate of return or the other actuarial assumptions, has to make a recommendation to the legislature about how to change benefits. Um, because of those losses. So I'm just, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but um, that is one thing that, that I've seen out there. Um, and then as, to, as far as Hal's question goes, I would, I would encourage people to read the um, Center for Retirement Research at Boston College's piece on board compensation, compensation. And I'll send that to Andrea so people can see it because that does provide a lot of detail um, about best practices around pension board structure. Right, other questions? Uh, yeah, if I can find my hand. Go right ahead. There we go. Um, so what is the, I get a question from email here. What is the logic behind having the treasurer oversee the elections of the employee participants since that's a very marked uh, deviation from what is done now. Uh, that that is my understanding of how the teachers retirement um, board is made up. Um, that the that the treasurer's office uh, facilitates the election, and so this was just a a proposal to systematize that across the um, across the different boards. Just a proposal. Happy to happy to hear reasons uh, from the individual trustee groups why they think that's a good or a bad idea. So, just to clarify for the people at home, uh, one size fits all is not necessarily what we're promoting here. One size fits all. Well, I mean, um, it could remain the way it is now. Because the state employees, uh, they elect members to the board, then the board elects members to VPIC. So it's a two-stage process, somewhat similar to the actual process that's being proposed, where the pension board member would come from the existing underlying board. Oh, and if I may be so uh, bold, the underlying boards still have a lot of stuff to do. Uh, it's not, in, I think, an answer to Rob's question. Uh, they manage the 457 to define contribution funds. They do disabilities. They they have full schedules of things that they do. Uh, there is no real interplay between the underlying boards and VPIC now, except for annually when the rate of return is set. Uh, 
Uh, Tanya, your hand is up. Is that from before or do you have another question? Okay, uh, Peter Anthony. I, I'd like to go back to Rob's uh, query about the uh, commission as it's envisioned. Um, and I think he was focusing on the commission rather than the existing uh, pension boards, uh, which sort of uh, provide the foundation of the commission's work. Uh, so my comment is focused on assuming that uh, Rob was interested in whether or not the commission itself, in addition to uh, umpiring the uh, frequency and um, choice of actuary activities and the strategy of investment, I think Rob, I heard Rob to say, would they not have anything to do with benefits? Uh, were things to not be going so well? He didn't add that, I'll add it. I'm, I'm nervous about that. I think inherently, as uh, John has proposed this, and I agree with it, uh, what, what we want is uh, folks who <clears throat> are, are not going to be uh, swayed or influenced in their application of their respective expertise by what may or may not um, be necessary as a result of their advice or their observation or their conclusion. Uh, I, I don't see how um, benefits being a part of uh, labor management, dynamic HR interests, uh, taxpayer interests, it is inherently political, and I use that word political, not in the oftentimes um, unfortunate uh, derogatory term, but rather to, to recognize uh, that politics is where people come together who have different interests, views, vantage points, uh, and they try and find a way forward. Um, and that's the way it should be, um, as I think we do in the assembly, uh, general assembly. So I, I'd say leave the benef leave the commission out of that uh, corrective action sort of uh, arena. Uh, the treasurer undoubtedly uh, will continue to play a role <clears throat> in in saying to the general assembly um, and the administration, uh, "Listen, folks, uh, we need a course correction here," and I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, I just don't I don't think the expertise actually is applicable to the, the uh, compromise, the level of compromise between the uh, potentially um, uh, differing parties is useful. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, other questions um, or any clarifying uh, information that would be helpful for you to just understand what we're looking at here for a governance proposal? All right, Chris, anything that you, any, any questions that were posed that you uh, feel like you've got uh, a burning desire to, <laughs> to, to answer from, from your perspective as joint fiscal? I, I think, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the, the only thing I would just maybe put a, a slightly sharper point on was, you know, one of the, one of the prior members, I, I apologize, who um, raised the question of, you know, sort of maintaining that balance of power and, and, and the involvement of all the stakeholder groups in the commission. I, I do just want to, I want to point out that this proposal calls for nine of the 15 uh, commissioners, uh, nine of the 15, those uh, individual trustee boards would play a role in choosing who those folks would be. So um, three of those nine would be existing, uh, you know, employee or retiree, um, you know, trustees who sit on those trustee boards. And then each of those boards would have a role in nominating, you know, one public member and one employer member from each group. So nine of the 15 seats, um, they, they would have a role in, in, in the selection process. Yeah. Uh, Sam if Thank you, Madam Chair. I am just clarifying that the 15 members, besides the treasurer, I mean, she'd be paid for her role, but this board will not be paid for this position? Um, nothing has been determined. My, my um, thought was that we would mirror the way, um, the way the trustees and VPIC are currently compensated. But we can decide that ourselves and make a proposal. 
could I get a refresher on how they are currently compensated? Um, you can if somebody knows the answer to that, because I'm not sure that I know. 50 bucks a meeting unless you're already on the state's payroll. And expenses, mileage. John Gannon. So um, just for to, to explain that to Samantha, that's the standard compensation for, for members of boards and commissions that the legislature creates. It's the big bucks. Any other questions from committee members? All right. Um, thank you, Chris, for your uh, help in walking through this slide deck. Um, so just to remind folks, we are going to take a 30 minute break here this morning, and then we'll come back and take a look at a, a post um, pension design um, plan change. And, uh, and after we do that, and depending on how much time we have, um, we will begin hearing from other folks who would like to share their perspective on both of these proposals. Um, I think it, for the sake of uh, clarity, it would be helpful if we have at least that first round of reactions. Um, we'll do a round of reactions on the governance proposal, and then we can do a round of reactions on the uh, plan design proposal. Um, these are rolling out together on the same day and will ultimately, I think, be a part of the same bill. Um, but they're two very different conversations, and uh, and I'd like us to to be able to to hear clearly, you know, what people love and hate about each of the uh, each of the proposals separately. That we will ultimately build into one bill. Questions on process or content, Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the question I've got is is so. This information is already out there somewhere so that there are groups that are looking at it as well that are gonna testify already? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll hear from we'll hear from as many folks as want to. And, and, and fact, how did I've, that how did that get to them? Where where was that that they could access that information? Um, what what we have is going up on our committee page as we as we cover it. So um, people may not be fully digested in terms of reaction to things until they've had a chance to sit down with it, but, um, but that's all going live when we look at it in committee. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions on the governance document or on the process going forward? All right, um, so the middle of our morning is uh, is intended to be a 30 minute break and I'm thrilled that we're hitting that mark uh, earlier rather than later <laughs> so that we have more time in committee. Um, so let us take a break now until 1015 and um, you can leave the meeting and come back to the same link and, uh, and we'll be back here in. Thank you.